Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Out of Your League, the Super League podcast. We are delighted this evening to be joined by Lee Radford, current Castleford Tigers head coach, fellow East Hullian. Hullian, is that a thing? Hullensian. Hulster. The East Hulster, Lee Radford. Uh, Rad, it's good to have you over in Manchester. How are you, Thank you for having me. Yeah, how how are you feeling being outside of the district of Hull for... Very good. I've worn my attire, just so everybody knows. Yeah. Just, just in case, just in case anybody don't recognise me. And he looks yeah. cool as well with it, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. What you, can't, that. what you can't see, it's got Coach written on the... Coach Rad has written on the back, which is what you can't see. Yeah, so, saving that for Friday. <laughs> saving the Coach Radders for Friday. So you, it, we're in the middle of a heat wave, Radders. So just a bit of context. You, you've been out with the boys training today. Yeah, we had um, recovery today, so the, the the lads obviously that had not played, and the lads that you know we have got plenty in the injury room at the moment, so they've done their bits. But the majority of them have just done recovery today and, and a bit of review from um, Saturday's game, um, you know, which obviously was was big for us and big for a lot of the boys as well. So um, it was a it was a positive one. Yeah, so we'll get into you know Castleford and, and where you are now, but I thought. What would be interesting is is we hear a lot about your sort of coaching career and your playing career, but let's get right back to the the start of who was Lee Radford as a as a, as a kid. Like, what was your childhood like? Uh, it was a Branzonian, so he was off Branzone. Yeah, he was forever in bother. I think. Um, For people who don't know Branzo, describe Branzone because um, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but. so it's it's the I think it's still the biggest housing estate in um, in Europe. I think it's got the one of the highest criminal records as well up there. So it's a, it's a, it's it's a salt of the earth place, but it's it's a tough estate. I think I think they could describe it as that. And as you know, there's been some fantastic players, obviously, to come from that area as well. Um, and and rugby league back then was was really big then. So I'd gone on holiday as a I think I was ten year old and met the coach of Cot Tigers who was sat on the same we used to go on a bus to a starting <laughs> yeah. so we unfortunately got sat next to me and, and managed to bend my ear and go and play for Cottingham Tigers which is obviously the other side of all um you know and I'll be for, forever grateful for my dad for obviously shuttling me up there every Tuesday Thursday and um that's how Lee Radford got involved in rugby league I think. And were you were you into school at that age, what 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 were you like as a as a sort of young kid? No, I was I was sport. I think just in general, I couldn't I couldn't stand school. Um, football, I loved football, um, and I really enjoyed boxing as well. So um, and anything to to keep me on the street was was pretty much where I was at. And sport was an out was it an outlet for you, or was it or was it something that you were naturally were you, were you this big when you were a kid? No, no, I had a late I had a late spare, um, but I, but I really enjoyed it. I was quite I think I am quite competitive, so well, whatever it was, um, I was pretty competitive at. But like I say, fo probably football was my first love, um, and unfortunately I became a rugby league player. There's so many rugby league players that were just uh, frustrated footballers who never made it, weren't they? Is that but you? That's you, Foss. Hundred percent, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just get a football hour training, and everyone would go mad, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. They'd love it. But do you reckon sport was kind of a bit of way of getting you on the straight and narrow and away from maybe getting into bother a little bit? Or I, do you do both? No, I think so. Definitely later on at 15, 16, when a couple of the kids I was knocking about was getting in bother, I think it definitely, I um, I drifted towards and gravitated towards the rugby instead of, you know, what was going on socially. But it, but like I said, as a it was anything to keep you out. I loved yeah. being out on the, on the street, no matter what you was doing. I loved being out on the street. I think that's probably something that's probably changed a little bit in society. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't have to leave your bedroom to hang about with your mates anymore, which mm. for us dinosaurs, we can't get our heads around that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And why were you attracted to, to the sport and not the... Because when you say, like, the other things, what, what we're talking about here is, is girls, drink, you know, anti-social bits, <laughs> being out and about. And it's just, just being out and about. Yeah, it, just, it, just gen, you know. But what was it, what was it that... Why, why sport at that point? Because a lot of people don't choose sport at that point, don't they? Yeah, do you know? I don't. I don't. It's probably the same reasons. Now I just I enjoy physically being active. I enjoyed whether it was running away from somebody or, or <laughs> a police. Or, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, but or running towards somebody. In the case of rugby league, it was whatever it was. I enjoyed the. I reckon the physical element of it, um, and I enjoyed being out. I couldn't stand being in. Uh, you know, I. 
touch your feet when I sat at home, unfortunately. Do you recognise any of that flash? You know, for you growing up, as in, you, you chose sport, didn't you, at a young age? But yeah. what was it that drove you to choose I was, it? I, when Radis said it was competitiveness, it was the same for me. I was everything I played or took part in, I wanted to win. And when you can, you know, concentrate that all that energy towards a sport, that's that's what you live for, then, isn't it? And I was never the best, and probably similar to Radis, like a late developer. Um, so I think you know that competitive ebb makes you want to train, makes you, make, makes you want to be better. And if you've got role models in your life that can show you the way, my dad and older cousins and stuff probably were a big reason for that myself. I think it just yeah, channels all that energy in, in a positive direction, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, you, you spoke about this Cot Tigers coach who you bumped into on a, <laughs> on a coach holiday um, and your dad and the commitment. How important, were they the main role models? do you think, in, in, in um, putting you on that path? Yeah, I think so. I think at that time, definitely. My, my dad was probably his, his stereotype. That it doesn't matter what you did, it was never quite quite good, yeah, you yeah. Know, quite good enough. I think that was, um, that, that was a common theme. But that's, that, again, a generational thing, I think, that you, you, you accepted the criticism. You, that, funny, we had this conversation. So when, when I played bad, and I'm sure you two have been in the same position, you'd get in the car and you won't speak to you. <laughs> and I can remember, I can remember playing the Yorkshire Cup semi-final once. I think it was in Leeds. I had a full hour and a half, and he didn't say one word. It was the most <laughs> uncomfortable car ride I've ever been involved with. But you know, when you think back and you think, well, that's what maybe social well, services yeah, get involved yeah, now, yeah, aren't they? You know? Dad, if you're watching, I'm <laughs> sorry. I've been bullied. I've been bullied. <laughs> speak to him for some people, hour. Yeah, when you speak to the players that I've coached, they'll all say that's a common theme with me as well. So. I like the negative and, and very and if and if you're not in my office you're going all right. Yeah, and was it tough love then? Right? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, but uh, but you know one I'm really appreciative of definitely. Yeah. And what about you, Mark? You know that home environment for you. Your dad, you obviously no, well, we spoke we speak about your dad. Your dad being a player, mm. your dad being a good player as well. Like, yeah, how my, did that? My dad was a bit of a legend in Oldham. Played for Great Britain a few times, so he was always he was always a bit different because I think he saw the higher pressure on me that because I was Terry's son. I was always a pressure on me. So if I play bad, he'd make me feel, he'd make me feel better by saying, oh, you only dropped it four times, you know? <laughs> and like try and polish your turd a little bit because he knew that I played rugby and in Oldham I was Terry's son all the time. So that was a consequence of him really. So I think he was, all, didn't feel guilty at that, but he'd always want to shield me from it a little bit. So yeah, I'd be my own worst critic, I think. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, no, I think I think people are either I think you can be crafted out of negativity or pos like or positivity, can't you? It's that in between, I think, where people get lost, where they haven't got anybody who's really critical or really positive about them when they're a kid. I do think that old old school brothers, when I listen to you talk and you know, about a lot of things in the game, you you're old school still. Yeah. Aren't yeah, you? Yeah, definitely yeah, I think I am. Yeah. I think um it's a funny one. I got asked last week about the, the mental health issue, obviously, with, with what's going on with Jacks at the moment yeah. and what's been been said. Um, and one of the one of the, the chaps from the press said, you know, I'm really I'm really big on this at the moment. I don't know if he's had issues recently, but it was it was one of them. And and I'm sure you two have been in the changing rooms. It, stuff like that. One. You know, you, you went home and kicked the cat. You didn't you didn't talk about no. uh, you know what was going on in between your ears. It was you got on with it, and and I just think whether that is an old school thing, or it's a new generation thing where they feel comfortable talking, more comfortable talking about it. I don't know, but it's not something I've. Um, you know, I can't imagine me going in a change room with Brian McDermott and Bernard Dwyer and and the Mike Forshaw and. You know, telling them I, I'm struggling a little bit. I don't know that I'd have got. I don't know that. I'd have, I don't know <laughs> I that reception. You know, I, I think you know <laughs> how it have got. Yeah, yeah. I'd have probably got bolted out back into the other one. It took me seven years to get in their changing room, so I'd, I think I'd have been kicked straight back into the other one. So, so if we took ten-year-old Lee Radford and took him out of Brand's own tough upbringing, tough love at home, but in a, in a in a good way, not it's not always a negative thing, and then put you into the modern world in a home environment. How alienated do you think you'd feel by all that? I, I, I think I'd have been a bully. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Ge genuinely, I think I think uh, um, some of the stuff we did back then, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be acceptable today. I don't think. Um, and it's funny listening to, you know, my assistants, coaches have both got daughters and sons who are, are that ten and twelve, and um, you know, some of the things that parents have said to them 
about their sons, what they've you know said to the sons and daughters. Um, I'm scratching my head thinking, well, that was an everyday thing that 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 occurred when I was that age. So um, it's look, it's it's the way that of the world, I suppose. At the moment, it's not something I particularly agree with. Um, whether that's old school or just being a grumpy old man, I, don't, I generally don't know it? what that is. Are you resisting? I'm trying my best. The modern yeah. world. Yeah, you I are. Am, I've, I've, so you've not got TikTok and Instagram? No, I'm not on, not on any form of social media, no. I, I ain't got a temperament to be no. on there, I don't think. Well, you're like that, aren't you? You're a, yeah. an old school. Yeah, my, da my dad's old school. old school. My dad was an old school fella, you know, he's a mm. big big farmer, tough, tough fella. Um, not good at talking. Like, you know, say talk about your feelings. Yeah. I don't think my dad's strength has ever been maybe talking about how he felt. Give me tough love, you know. He, he, yeah, there was clear lines with my dad. If I got yeah. it wrong, like, there was consequences. And I think... Mm. For me, like when it, it it was like imprinted on me that I had certain things, expectations I had to deliver, you know. Mm. And I th I think there's something in that, but I don't know if it's been lost or what. But it's certainly changed, and I feel like it's changed really quickly as well. I don't think it's like maybe flashy. It's a recent thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think you're maybe rad as me, you, and I think then maybe the generation down, and then mm. the next one, it's it's really changed. Quite, quite quick. Really quick, really quick. I said this last week. We, we, we I went and watched the academy play last week, and they'd, they'd been beat. So I love the fact they'd all gone in the, the changing room straight after the game. Obviously, the opposition team was all getting selfies after the game, which it, you know again is selfies with the family in the stand. And again, it's not something I'd ever done. It was mobile phones and, and particularly photography, mobile phones went out then and. Within 10 minutes, our lads had come back out having been beat and was then getting selfies. And yeah. I also <laughs> found out not only had that happened, but some of them had started eating the pizzas after the game before the coach had got in there. Oh. So I'd gone from being pretty proud of you know the fact that they've gone <laughs> in the change room, got their heads down, <laughs> it hurts to lose, <laughs> go home, sulk about it for a, a day, and then tomorrow comes, you're happy again. It just done. Yeah. Do you know I when you talk about competitiveness? That, that's been. I don't know where that's got been lost. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that's always been the norm in the dressing rooms I grew up in as a young lad. Was you, you everything to win, and then when you lose, you're devastated, or you you you, you, do, you at least won't project that you're not asked having selfies or having pizza. I remember you saying a few years ago, and won't name them the player, but you lost in a playoff semi, and straight afterwards, all he wanted to know was what well, everyone's wearing fancy dress the next day. For Mad Monday, yeah, yeah, and that—I that, remember you telling that story, and it yeah. pissed me off for about a couple of hours. Yeah, I, I struggle with the modern stuff, but <clears throat> I don't know. I, th I think times change, don't they? As well, like, and you can—we can sound like absolute Dinosaur. dinosaurs here, like, yeah, and we probably, probably yeah. and we probably yeah. do. Yeah. We've probably lost fifty percent of viewers here. Yeah, no, they've switched the off already. Fam. They've, they've switched gone. Off. As soon as they they've saw gone. you in your full training kit, they turned <laughs> off. <laughs> but I was trying to think, right? If the things in the modern game that maybe players are doing now that if you put that in a changing room with Bernard Dwyer what do you think would annoy him the most do you think it's the post-match thanks to the fans clapping in front of like an, a stadium there's what the the social media tweet sorry about the game on to next week yeah fans was awesome yeah just don't shout apologize. out to just, the boys yeah don't apologize just play better yeah. yeah, just play better yeah, than you it's did. Quite so it's just, that's the we have to get Bernard Dwyer in. Yeah. What we need we to. We need. You need to get that we'll money. We we'll get Bernard Dwyer in and just go through the social media output of Super League players, <laughs> and then we'll 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 get him. He can just make a cut, can't he? So anything anything worse than this, and you're out. So you talk about like tough love, tough upbringing, but a good upbringing. Yeah. And then rugby league, at, at ten years old, go to Cot Tigers. Uh, Cottingham for again for people who don't know Cottingham's a nice part of Hull isn't yeah, it? it's yeah, a good it's a, a, it's a good a good spot and yeah. and uh, so talk us through that then did you, did you at ten was that your first time you'd played rugby league yeah no I played it in on on the fields and in, and in the you know so I was daft, but in the streets um, but never played it for a team I never played it at school um, but from there obviously you know really enjoyed it was was. Okay at it as well, so you know, love the applaud as well, um, and then from there, it just became a little bit too much from from Brandsholm to to Cottingham. Is it's a trek, particularly at five o'clock when yeah. you're getting there for six. So when you're training two times a week, um, I ended up going back to Old Boys, the old old 
the old old boys. Um, so and training East Park, I yeah, yeah, boys, with yeah, Jim Brown. Um, and then the year I'd gone there, it divided into Masons, it turned into Masons, which yeah. was your former club. Um, and it was all over a, a tour to Spain. My, the, our team wanted to go to Spain. They'd raised a lot of <laughs> money to go to Spain. On the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, well, was it the dads who wanted to go to Spain? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll play like yeah, every touch on the wanted to go to Spain. Think, so so that they ended up splitting um, from all boys going to Masons. Um, and it was worth it. It was a fantastic trip. And we ended up doing it for, for a few years after that. But um, it's funny, on them trips, you sort of, one of the beauties of this game you make friends for life and yeah. that was that was certainly the case on that yeah and then so from there to we'll get to Hull Sharks you know and the, the debut for Hull Sharks but how quickly along the journey were you thinking or did you ever think actually this could be something you know for me I'm, I'm good at this or was it something that you stumbled across yeah I think I think 15 it, it, and it came really quick so I went from signing halfway from being 15 to making my debut at 16 for the first team and it's yeah. it just come from uh, there was a bit of disappointment at school level I never got picked for England schools at under 16 and that was a real that was a real drive it killed me that um that's and in, looking that's back in, that's interesting though isn't yeah it? is I, that I, I I feel like young careers need that and a piece of adversity don't yeah they? and it's funny when you see that now when kids and I, and I say this a lot when kids you know, we put so much focus on, on scholarship when kids don't get selected. You know, obviously, I've, I've been involved in the amateur game in a long, in a long time. When kids don't get, you know, I've seen kids quit because they've not been selected for mm. either Roll or game, Rovers. We? we lose them at 16. And yeah. when I look back, I'm thinking, well, that was my motivator. That was, you know, I, I don't know, obviously, why you're differently, but um, that adversity was a kick up the ass for me. And um, So was that 12 months before you made your first team debut? Yeah. Yeah, um, but I, I genuinely don't think I'd have made my first team debut if that didn't happen. Yeah, um, and I'm pretty sure you've all had similar experiences at some stage of of I won't say adult life because it won't, but your professional, not professionals, sort of amateur professional careers. Yeah, what was there a point, Flash, in your young sort of playing career that you think? It could have gone one way or the other. Yeah, when I, when I was 16, I was never the best in my team, but there was two or three lads that signed for clubs. And they were like, they'd go on the national camps and sign for clubs and do all the scholarship training. And every Sunday we'd play a tough team and they'd cry off. And it used to make me think, why? Because they didn't fancy because they were already signed and thought they were already on the way. And they pro that was the, probably the motivator for me because I, I'd play and I'd rip in with my mates. And then I knew that I was, I was more geared for it than they were. And then from that, I kind of got an opportunity and then just took it from there, really. But yeah. yeah, I was, I think missing out or not being selected drove me to, to train a bit more or to, or to just try harder, really. Yeah, I think failure builds resilience, doesn't it? And, and, and like we've got to expose young athletes to fail yeah. more. And, and instead of being about the tracksuit and being about getting a contract, about That's putting out on social media that you've, 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 you've made it, the actual concept of made it, making it, for me is an alien thing because throughout my full career I never felt like I made it mm. I, I never felt like I made it I felt like I was doing it but I hadn't made it and I think we're too quick to try and put young people into the the, the mindset that they've made it that they've achieved something and, and I think slowing that down and putting adversity in there is just a better way to build some I think it's difficult to slow down through social media yeah. because the, the minute they get the tracks out, the minute they, they set, there's a picture of them there and, and that's it and that's all they're then acknowledged for. Um, again, a generational thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it just reminded me of a funny story. So when I signed for OKR, it was on, it was on the back page of the whole Daily Mail, but it's <laughs> a bit like the social media of the past, wasn't it? Yeah. And me, me and my dad had a picture taken with a coach then. It was a guy called Dave Harrison. And... Um, Anyway, my dad's trousers had folded in an awkward way. It looked like he had a massive stiffy. <laughs> so I signed for all KR. And you know what these still lads Look are like. My dad's on the back, back page yeah. and he just looks yeah. like he's got a giant <laughs> stiffy in his cakes. I'll get that. If we can fly that, I'll get the image for you and we'll just fly it in now so we can see it. I'll take a tape at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sky Sports News. Big Phil. Right. My old man had been knuckling the, the week before. 
Well, all his first foot's <laughs> out there. So there's a picture of me sat here with him in the background and he's got his first Slide on his So you couldn't see all his face that had swelled up. <laughs> so then all sharks, Radders, that, that was... Because um, that was a mad time for... Yeah, Hull as a like the Mad. club was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Hull it was, FC. It was on the ropes, wasn't it? Yeah, at that time. So, so we was championship. It was Hull FC when our time. Yeah. It was Hull FC, um, and then I think halfway through a season, um, David Lloyd, obviously um, the tennis player, came in and, and bought the club through uh, Tim Wilby and a, a chap called Peter Tunks. And Peter Tunks was a, an agent, obviously out in in Australia. We had a few blokes over here. Um, and it was the, you know, it was the saviour. It was influx of money, influx of cash. I think he bought Old City as well. He did. He bought the yeah, football yeah. club as well. And um, it started out rosy. I think we brought Alan Runt in from St. Helens. Precky came from St. Helens. Steve Booth came from St. Helens. We signed a load from, from Bradford as well. And um, everything was unkidori. And then maybe a couple of months in, um, you used to get paid in cheque back then. So you'd wait for your cheque on a on a... Friday. It's cash. Yeah, yeah, He's it's lying. cash. Yeah, He's yeah. lying. No, HMRC, genuinely, HMRC genuinely, HMRC all genuinely over check it. under his floorboards. <laughs> when cash. I was under 16, I was getting paid in cash. I'd go to the director's <laughs> room and get me 250 quid. It was the best time of my life. Um, and then straight in tower. From <laughs> tower for an hour. <laughs> yeah, so it was checks and, and then we'd be waiting for the checks. Everybody would be waiting for the checks. Then we'd get to all the phone call. Oh, he's on the M62. He's coming. And it just stopped, you know, we ended up spending the afternoon in, in Old City's um, reception. The, the, the bed or work behind there must have been fuming with, you know, we can imagine 30-odd pissed off rugby players that have not been paid. Obviously, some of them had mortgages to pay. At the time, I was, I was fine. I was on peanuts and probably still living off my mum and dad anyway. So um, it started going pear-shaped pretty quickly. Um, and then I got to to play in that championship a little bit. I think I made seven or eight games and, and Bradford came in for me. I'd played Yorkshire with Nobby by Noble and um, I met him and Matt Elliott at my house and they offered me a deal which I agreed to and signed. Um, then a month or two after, you know, decided I didn't, didn't want to go. So I got an agent involved and, and told him that, look, I want to stay at Hull. I've already signed at Bradford. He said, that's fine. We'll get you out with that deal and we'll We'll keep you at all, and it and it just carried on and on and on. I remember Steve Crooks coming down to a training session, saying they want you in the boardroom. Crooks. Yeah, Crooks, are, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'd gone up, gone up, and they said we need you to sign this today, the contract for all FC. And I, I was, I'd, mobile phones weren't about then, so I've been trying to get on the blower to to ring the agent to say what what should I do. I was only, I think I was only 17, 18 at the time, and um, thankfully. I just got a photo signing the contract. The old Daily Mail again was ready yeah. to go. My dad wasn't there resigning this <laughs> time. And um, on the night, Bumbley Radford signs for FC in the old Daily Mail. With that, the agent left about three answer phone messages on my house phone. Bradford want hundred grand for you if you if you stay in that if you stay in that hole. So, so didn't know what to do. And then ended up going to a tribunal, and because Bradford had asked for hundred grand that's for me, me yes, yeah, back me then, that's messy. That yeah, no, it, was, it was horrendous because at the time I was getting hammered, like yeah, well, yeah. obviously by the old, old fans. Um, so because Bradford had asked for hundred, when it went to tribunal, Bradford ended up paying hundred for me <laughs> to come from all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that backfired <laughs> pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Business, so, yeah. But what what? People don't realise is that hundred grand probably saved the club because they was done. They they went into liquidation after that, yeah. and it kept them afloat. So, so you're the saviour. I'd I'd like to say yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I've got. Lee, I'm glad I've got this on there. Lee Radford, yeah, the saviour yeah. of Hull Sharks <laughs> FC. Yeah. Gates Gates yeah. said. Gates Hull <laughs> Sharks. Yeah. So that was eight eight games yeah. for a young guy, yeah. and then all this that that's a lot going on there, isn't it? That's that's big. Th Things was that the first time you were really scrutinised? Do you know where you felt like the attention and the spotlight was on you? I can't, no, I didn't. I never felt like that ever. Never. No. Um, I, I didn't think it was a big. I don't. I don't know why. I just thought I took it in me. It was just what it was. It was a funny one. It was obviously it was. It was fantastic playing first team. You, you did it yourself at OKR. Yeah. And you, you was more bothered about going in peppies on Sunday night than you yeah, yeah. than you probably was rugby. You know, just as important at the time, socially. So, um, was it was it a big thing? Today, it probably would have you know made more headlines than it did yeah. back then. It was it was 
it was under the radar. We, obviously, you know, there was no social media and there was no mobile phones. Yeah, and what year was that then, the Bradford move? That would have been 96, 96. 96, 96 what, 97. And what a time, Flash, to be going to Bradford, oh. Bradford Bulls. Oh, when he was, we were speaking then, I was just trying to reminisce about the players that played from uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And they were, you were going to a good club then. That's when they were just coming into the peak out, weren't they? I was yeah. getting to it. Who was in who's in the dressing room, Radders? Come on. So it when was that. It was it was Jimmy Laws. It was it was Brian Mack. It was Bernard Dwyer. It was obviously Robbie. We'd signed Henry that year as well. So he had an, an aura about him at that time. He was the only bloke running about wearing white boots at that time. Yeah. So he was he was pretty special. Mick Withers signed the same year, and obviously Scott Naylor had gone from Salford. It was, it was just an hard ass. Mm. Um, an hard assed environment, I think. How did that shape you be just coming in as a as a lad at eighteen, played eight games? How did it shape you going into that dressing room? Yeah, massive. Just um the place itself was 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 different. It was a step up in intensity, it was a step up in it was it was literally one I can remember playing Saints on a I made my Bradford debut on a Saints on a I think it might have been an Easter Monday and, and we'd been hammered. Been hammered and it was an embarrassing performance. And obviously they'd, they'd won it the year before and they was right up there for contact. And I can remember coming into training the next day at Road and Meadows and I'd set off at eight o'clock to get there for an half ten start. And I'd gone in and I can remember seeing a couple of blokes like fall off the rowing machine. Like, like literally Paul Anderson had you know steam coming off his head. And I'm thinking, I've, I've got my times wrong here. So I went upstairs to apologise to Matt Elliott in his office. And he said, no, we're not on till half ten. The day after the game, at, like a session that I'd punished themselves, like you can't imagine that happening anymore mm -hmm. either. And it was, it was literally one of them. I, I even need to change what I'm doing quick, or I'm not going to stay in this environment um, very long. I think. And was it what professionalism, or was just it just bang at it? Just the, the, listen, the, the, the weekend, the, you know, there the was old school. The the, the, the socialised after a game, but when they came training, it was a different, it was a different gravy. And what? Did that do to you then mentally? Did like how quickly did you get up to speed? Real that 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 day was probably a big drive on by myself and fuck, I better shape up. Yeah, here. I think there's points when you walk into a dressing mm. room, and I, and I felt it like when I was a young guy, I came from Hulk out to St Helens, and you walk in and you realise what you are doing is not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. And and that that's the power of like a strong dressing room or or a big club flash, isn't it? Yes. That moment where you completely out your depth. It's character. When I was. Um, from when I signed at Salford, 2016, to when we got to a grand final, a Challenge Cup final, I remember looking around the dressing room and seeing lads who've been in, the, played at the big clubs, Warrington, Saints, Wigan, and they've been in those environments and they've taken all that they, that the, that the senior players have given them in terms of um, like what, how to perform, how to train, just expectations. And we had a little bit of success because we'd fed that into the rest of the environment. But when I signed, there was none of that. I think it's character. I think it's it's that culture that some clubs have and they keep going, but you need certain figures to, to kind of really carry the torch for that, don't you? And those days, I think... God, I, do, yeah, I sound old now. We do, it's been a real old interview, this. I was but, like three granddads. Yeah. But those days... You, you, right, let's list some names that were in that dressing room. You said Henry Paul, Robbie Paul. You know, you've got uh, McAvoy, you've got Withers. To Paul of Anderson, our corner, to obviously, Leslie Kim. The, the year after it was the Joe Van the, the the team it, obviously you yeah. played against it plenty of times it was it was big but big characters right? yeah. my point is it, it not just big in character it was big in its physicality as well wasn't it yeah it, it was an unnaturally it was a ginormous team I, of big personalities I think it was unorthodox at that time wasn't it I don't think anybody had seen a team where the two wingers was as big as the, the front rows and I think that was um a massive strength for it, and uh, like you all said, personality-wise, there was some. You know, Jamie Peacock obviously yeah, missed yeah. him as well. There was some real, um, some real egos in there to, to manage, mm -hmm. but the, the chemistry of the group was was phenomenal. And who were the leaders then? And, and what did? How did they lead? I, th I think Jimmy Jimmy Laws was was obviously massive in what he did, and he was just old school. He was. <laughs> I hope his missus didn't watch it, but he was fall out of a nightclub at two o'clock, turn up training the next day and still beat everybody in conditioning. That was, you know, and I am joking, that got, that filtered down because Stuart Fielding, six years later, could do that. He could walk out of a nightclub and still win the conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that was a mental thing or it was a, it was just physically that fit. That they, they had an influence on, 
you know, the likes of Paul Deacon, the likes of Leon Price, certainly myself and Stuart Fielding that, that came up, you know, your Rob Parkers that that filtered through um, before them, I think. I think it's a real powerful thing when your best players or your best performing athletes, whatever it is, are the most influential as well and strongest characters. Yeah, and, and I think the example you set by turning up not at your best and then producing your best is massive, yeah. you know, and I think that gets lost a bit is... Um, I always remember there was a time at Saints and St. Helens, in, I think it was 2005, signed Vinnie Anderson, who was playing for New Zealand at the time. And a, an amazing player, like class player. He didn't drink, he didn't really socialise an awful lot with the lads. And I remember going out with Wello on a Sunday and we got smashed and turned up to train on a Monday. And we were doing shuttles and I, I, I blitzed him. And I felt bad. And, you know, I was no, dehydrated, <laughs> I just felt awful. And I blitzed him. And I remember looking at him and thinking, I got, I got you covered here. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can't yeah. even come, you will not come near me. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And there's something in, we were chatting off air about, you know, habits players have. I think maybe one of the things, the big things that we can teach younger players is the ability to perform when things aren't ideal, aren't well, it's perfect. Well, rep it's representative of a game situation. So when you're not at your best because you're on go over, I'm not saying this is right, but when you're not at your best because you're hungover over, you still turn up and give it your best. Well, on a match day when you've you've got an injury or you've you've done a lot of tackling or you, you're not you're not playing that well and, the, the, and you're down to twelve men, that's a similar kind of trigger in your brain that you need to turn up and you need to perform and you need to get the best out of yourself. So I think you can kind of use those skills that that you do on a, on a Monday morning from being on goal yeah. that you can take into a game to yep. a certain extent. Oh, well, we're not saying get drunk and, no, and play no. the day after. Not the day yeah. after, we're not. <laughs> well, Paul, give, it, Paul, give it 24 hours. Paul, yeah, Paul <laughs> Wellens, is, um, his, his mantra was, I think it was train dry, play wet. So he wanted to, he was consciously dehydrating himself at the start of a week <laughs> and then gradually building up his hydration towards the back end of the week. But that would have been some time at Bradford, that, because that was a successful team as well, wasn't it? It's not, I know we're speaking lightheartedly about social stuff, I think at that era, all clubs were in a similar boat with that. Yeah. But it was an exceptional team, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I think it was an elite environment at that time. I think it was a little bit ahead of its, you know, with, with what it was doing, pre-season camps. Um, you know, we had a full-time kit man. You'd, you'd, you'd rock up. I won't rock up like this. I'd rock up in your, in your normal gear. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to go in my Bradford gear just in case. They didn't know who I was, obviously. So <laughs> you'd go. Your kit was was laid out for you. Your boots was ready to go. The, the facilities and what they spent on facilities was, you know, heavy at that time. When you looked around different clubs, it was it was an elite um, an elite environment with the elitist players. I think. And what what year did you get there, Flash? I was there, two thousand and. Four, five, six, just as a an academy. But could you see? Was that still there then? Yeah, I, I would. Sometimes the big clubs would have the young kids train and and be tackling bags or just carrying the water or doing whatever. And I, I would be around these kind of characters and it kind of just observing how they operated was quite big for me. And and you'd do a conditioning session on the rower. And one thing that stuck out to me was the be lads being sick, internationals being sick, and I was thinking he's already really fit but then he's pushing his body, so he's spewing up. And I can't, that kind of stuck with me that I had to do the same um, because that's the mentality they had to be the best. And uh, yeah, it was, it was eye-opening for me at the time, massively so. Was one of the iconic teams of Super League, Brad, is that? Yeah, I think the all three side was, to, that we did the treble that year. I think it was the first time it had been done. I think that was, and, I, and I probably you've done the same, you know when you get off a bus and you think you're, Ten points up before you've even got your yeah. kit on. It was it was literally one, and I and I don't know whether I felt like that because when I got off the bus, there was a bloke stood there and a bloke who's that big, and it was just a, um, or it was a confidence thing because of how hard I knew they'd worked. It was um, I had an aura, a bit of an aura about that. Two thousand three side, I felt I had a bit of an aura about it. How much did that imprint on you as a coach? We'll get on to talking about you as a coach, but I look at your teams and I see big outside backs and I see. Whether that's by design or by who you've recruited or by chance they've just been there, but do you think that's imprinted on your subconscious somewhere? Possibly, yeah. I, 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 it's the old mantra: a good big one's always better than a good a good little one. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but I think um, I think it's changed slightly lately with the six again rule. I think the game's sped up a fair bit. The ball's yeah, in yeah. play a little bit more, and I just think. Um, 
you know, not so much size, but leg speed is really important, particularly for middles now. Yeah. Um, and fitness for your outside backs is, is big as well. So a Leslie Van Acolo might not have been as good today as he was back no. then because the game probably wasn't as quick and, you know, he wasn't as active on his pendulum. But when he carried the football, you had stud marks all over your chest. And, oh, no, and yeah. I, was, I was lucky enough only to play him on a couple of occasions. But I can remember playing him, having played with him, thinking... <laughs> This isn't this right. Is this, not right. This is yeah. not right. Yeah, you just imagine being that 19, 20, looking up, you seeing Shantaine happy, Vinicol. <laughs> he, he was like, he was really, really un, you know, as, as far as Super League centres go, Shantaine happy was yeah. phenomenal. Was so player. silky. Oh, yeah. just, but six just foot had three, a bit six of, foot four, yeah, and again, he had that yeah. class. Yeah. But it was an iconic team. I just, just reflecting on Bradford then as a club, how sad is it, Flash? Really Maybe sad. not. You know they're they're on the men maybe or or but but when you look at you Radha speaks about this elite environment and and that was the benchmark environment in rugby league, the best players, you know lead setting an example on match day experience on on how the welfare of the players was looked after you know pushing things kit changes the yellow kit in in 1997 yeah, yeah, at the Challenge yeah. Cup final as a young kid I I couldn't have been more excited you know there's a team playing in this weird yellow kit <laughs> at, at Wembley you know. They were innovating, pushing boundaries. And how sad is it now for the game to see where they are? Yeah, well, I used to go with my family to watch them against, not as a, as a Bradford fan, just to watch them play Leeds at Oddsall and there'd be 22, 23,000 regular. The atmosphere was unbelievable. Pre-match uh, um, entertainment and during half-time was, was up there probably, not as, as slick as NFL, but it was that kind of occasion where everyone had to be there and, and, and witness what was going on at Oddsall. Uh, and it's really sad, but... One thing I've noticed this last few years is the amount of talented players that have come out of Bradford, even now. So you look at your Batemans, Whitehead, obviously the Burgess brothers, Jake Tr uh, Truman, and there's, there's, there's plenty more. But the longer that Bradford are in Super League and they're not a force, I think you'll see that kind of talent from Bradford dwindle a little bit. And I think it'd be really sad for the game if we haven't got this a Super League club in Bradford because they were once a powerhouse club, a probably household name in, in rugby and sport in the country. And... Um, yeah, I think a strong Bradford is, a, is is better for Super League in the game. Yeah, special time in your life that Radders. Very, yeah, definitely, and you know probably one of the best times in my life as well. I think. Yeah, what highlight? Um, World the, Club the, Challenge. The, yeah, no, the O five Grand Final was the right. was the one that, that that was my last game, and that was everybody's last. I think there was nine players leaving at, at that point. Is that when Moz played? That's when Moz played. That's yeah. when Andy Lynch um, got dropped for Moz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I it's funny. I. I had a panic attack after the game when we won it, so I couldn't breathe. I had a deep <laughs> on, obviously, yeah. <laughs> yeah, deep <laughs> <in. laughs> So, <laughs> Wait, hang on a minute. You had yeah, a panic attack I, after, after the game? After the just did, I don't know what happened. Generally, it's the first time it ever happened to me. Yeah. I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't <laughs> no comprende what was going on. So, the doc was on and he had the old... Uh, so, everyone celebrating the change. Uh, uh, no, this was on the field. This on the was field. after the game, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we used to overcome with emotion. Just emotion, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can remember collapsing. <laughs> Uh, then. This is an exclusive game. <laughs> it what is unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Embarrassing. <laughs> embarrassing. He actually kicked me while I was on the floor. He was on the staff then. So. Yeah. Um, no, it was. It was. It was unbelievable. It was to sign off like that. You know, you couldn't couldn't have thought of a better way for going for a lot of people who, you know, friends for life people who stay in touch with you know frequently. Yeah, in full circle then. Back to back to FC now. You're much more senior sort of guy. You know, you're going back to a club that you'd started at. What was your responsibility there? Going from such a like a culture like Bradford, going back to Hull FC, and and how did that? Did that? Were you a leader when you went back? Is a, is a, is a, <sighs> the question? I don't know about a leader. I, I, yeah, I think I led by my action. What what I think what I got a lot of was what did they do at Bradford? What was you doing at Bradford? What even from the coaching staff, it was a a Q and A of what Bradford did because you know yourself when you're at the top of your, your elite, your top of your game as a club, everybody else wants to get a little piece of that and find out what's working for them. And I just think that that was definitely the case um, back then. We got off to a horrendous start. It was John Keir who signed me. I think he only lasted six games. And um, a bloke called Peter Sharp came in, who was probably one of the best coaches I've had. Pete, he was a, he was a fantastic fella. And what he, made him so good? He he was a he was very good technically. Wrestled one really um, 
want a real big part of the game back then, but it was just finding its way into the game. I think Melbourne had started summit with, with Donoghue over in Australia. He ended up coming to us, the wrestle coach from, from Melbourne, and we ended up doing a bit with him. And um, He's he, ruthless, isn't he? Yeah, he, well, he, was, he chucked a few, few blocks out. I'll put it on him. Um, no, during that, so Uch me have he, he got he regretted that. <laughs> <laughs> he I've heard stories about yeah. this fellow. Yeah, no, so right, yeah. Give me, so I don't know this guy. So give John me, Donahue, I think yeah. he used to do a lot of grap block. Yeah, you got, you know, but. yeah. I, I don't think it was MMA back then, but he was he was on that scene and he was. They, they didn't look much on him. Do you know what I mean? If you seen him in a pub, you wouldn't think, you know, this block's gonna be tasty. <laughs> so he got his shoes off and he had his bare feet. That was it. He was he was done. So and he was just it was unbelievable. Like using his own body weight. It was just you know what they do. What they're very good at. He was again a bit ahead of his time. But he he sort of got a niche of how to how to introduce that into rugby and, and what the familiarities was. And I just thought he did. Um, it was, you know when he came over, it was probably something that had not been not till Maguire got over a couple of years after did that become. Um, a really big part of the British game, I think. But it was, we. I think we played you in the grand final that year, yeah. 2006. And we went on an incredible, I think it was a 19 game run at that time. For I mean, If you looked at your side compared to ours, you, know, you was caked in internationals yeah, and we yeah. was we was a lot of nobodies really. Was, is, is there any truth in this? Because when we were prepping for that grand final, we got told that there was some sort of standoff about money at true, all at that time. Very true, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, we um, well, that was one of the questions, what did they do at Bradford? Yeah. So we, the, the club had no expectancy of getting to a grand final. Um, so it's 48 hours team run. We'd been asking, as a senior players group, what's, what's, the, what's the reward, what's the reward? And it had been put off and put and off and put off. And it got to a point where, I can't remember the, the guy's name who was on the board, it was, if you don't come down and tell us what we're getting, we're not going to do team run. Which, looking back, was one of you know really big regret a man, but it but it could have been it should have been done round one. You know this is what you're getting if you get to a grand final. It's something I always do as a coach. If you win the Challenge Cup, this is what you get. Here's your financial reward, and here's your financial reward if you so get to a grand people final. People don't know there's prize money in this. Prize, prize money yeah. for the grand final, prize yeah. money for a Challenge Cup, and correct. Yeah. An expectation at big clubs that there's a division or some players get. Yeah, a portion and the yeah, yeah, a bit. yeah. So, so that happened, and he came in and told us the figure, and then we found out you got more for losing than we got for winning. That was one nil to us at the time. Already, <laughs> yeah. already, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, um, to make it worse, we'd we'd got into the changing rooms, and before we was going out to team run, they'd got us our suits. Well, they'd got them from Asda. George, <laughs> I, 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 I am not kidding. I had Barry Bethel's suit on when I put it. I, we, like I did this meeting in his suit. What was three sizes too big for me? It was, George, it has yeah, been. Oh, it was. Well, that was yeah. that. You know, what did they do at Brown? What did they do at Brown? And then when you told them, obviously, what you'd then the should have told them they got our man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was yeah, it was a regret. But it, you know, if I'm being brutally honest, you're not know, being brutally honest on paper. I don't think we'd have. We got close, I think. We, we, yeah, we got yeah. pretty close, but we probably weren't quite, um, weren't quite good enough, Cl Clubs need to go through that, though, a bit, don't they? Because if you don't get to big games, you sort of don't know the, how to behave in, 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 in sort of big environments. So for Hull, that was, was a landmark sort it, of game. It, it was, but it never never kicked on to anything. That was a, it was a spike, that, for, um, for a lot of years. And I can remember going been there as a player and going back as a coach and been pissed off every year. You'd go to a presentation night and they'd show the Challenge Cup 2005 final. Well, it was, it was 2013, like it was 2014. And I always used to think, I can't imagine a, a Saints or a Bradford or a Leeds showing cup finals from, you know, hanging on to that, yeah, that, yeah. that long ago. And um, unfortunately, that, that, that's um, how the club was. Yeah, boys. let's talk about your relationship with coaching then, because it wasn't as though you got to the end of your career and you went, right, now I'm going to become a coach. You had a relationship with coaching all throughout your career, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, got asked to coach Heat Still Under 8, um, which ironically was uh, an unbelievable. So they are, uh, Josh Hodgson played in that, that team. Um, Danny Alton was in and out. Mike Burnett was in and out. A lad called Liam Cunningham, he, he played pro. Um, Scott Spavin played at OKR. We, we ended up getting eight that made it professional from, from that team. I took them from under eights to under 16, so that was... Um, so you were coaching them? Yeah, yeah. That was big. Uh, well, this, imagine an eight-year-old kid. You know, when you think about this player. now, so, so I was coaching them, and then in my second year, I got asked to do the first team. 
Mm. So I was doing the under eights or tens or whatever it was at that time, and then the first team as well. So I used to say to my missus all the time, "This is this is what I want to do when I finish, so it'll be worth it." Um, and she was she was fuming. Yeah, fuming. Oh, <laughs> some of the some of the well, she she was working at P and O ferries, and she'd come home sometimes, and the kids would be at my mum's because I'd have dropped them at my mum's. She'd have to then go and pick them up, then get them ready for bed, and then I'd come in obviously after my second training session. So when you look back, it was. Yeah, I don't think too many people would have would have been that um, dedicated to the, to a profession you're not getting paid for. And why? Yeah, I was going to say, what attracted you to it? Yeah, do you know? I loved it. I don't know. I can't. I suppose I don't know. I, I you know, I and loved particularly with the first team socially, really, because I was coaching a lot of me lads that I knocked about with at the time. With the kids, it was just it was rewarding. I felt just just seeing them develop and. We had a really, like I said, we had a really, really good side. So, um, yeah, it was just something I really loved and really enjoyed. And, you know, probably decided back then when I finished, that's, you know, ultimately that's what I want to go and do. It's funny, we had Matt Pete in and he was speaking about his journey, you know, coaching at junior level, coaching kids, you know, for a long time. Do you think that's underrated as a route to get into, you know, you, you're a really established, well-known Super League coach now. But do you think that shaped and helped you become the coach that you are now, or was it just part of the process? No, definitely. I think there's some experiences there that that you, you know, because the East also we, we was pretty. We won't, you know, we was top of the, the national league at the time. We, we won the grand final, and it was just dealing with different. Cat, you know, you just mentioned Gary Weems there. The, the, the lunatic we had to pick him up from prison some some Saturdays to come and have a run out for us. It was yeah. just dealing. You know, when when people speak about dealing with characters at, at the level we're at now or involved in now. I don't think I'll ever deal with some of us who was as <laughs> mad as some of them <laughs> fellas. Are. And that can only be a, a good thing, I think. And then from that, so you, you, you're coaching the first team and junior rugby, and then obviously your the actual your playing career is coming to a finish. What was was that always sharp in your mind that you wanted then to go into coach at Hull? Not, not so much at all. Just, just coaching in general. I think the the opportunity came at all when when Richard Agar went and Adam Pearson came in. Um, he employed um, Peter Gentle from Australia. Um, Sean McCrae. Sean McCrae was director of rugby. And Sean and McCrae didn't. He he'd have been a sideline. Oh, he was he was yeah. in the box. He was commentating. Sean. He was yeah. commentating. He um, <laughs> yeah. He was he was different bomber. He was. He's talked his way through through a career and done a, you know, you've got to tip your hat to, to <laughs> somebody who can delegate as well as that. You've got nothing but admiration for. <laughs> so coaching flash, what's, you know, you, you've you never had an interest in it. Have you ever, ever given it a blast? No, I think, I love rugby, but I just, I love the spectacle. And I think um, sometimes when I'd see coaches doing video for hours on end before we got to training or, scrutinizing you know a review of a training session i just it took the the love out of it for me i think i think it'd be too yeah too much for for me i think i, I like just to watch a game for 80 minutes and or play for 80 minutes and i don't think i commit the commit the time that, no. that these guys do and are you obsessed are you obsessed with the rugby? yeah with rugby? I, think, yeah. I think you have to yeah, be yeah 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 i think completely i think i've got an that's my personality you've I've got an obsessive yeah. personality yeah i have yeah so yeah. if you get into something you're That's, fucking in yeah, yeah, all, yeah, all yeah. in yeah. what else have you been Anything else? Golf, golf, golf. During COVID, so obviously, <laughs> the restaurant I've got is on a golf course. I was the only person playing golf in England at that time, and honestly, I was on there. I was, I was getting to eighteen rounds in every day. It was the best <laughs> yeah. time. Oh, I got obsessive over that as well. Yeah, yeah. But it was, you know, I really enjoyed it. Loved it. Yeah. Loved is that it. is that your strength and your weakness then? Yeah, I think. I you, think you, if you, you ask people around me, sometimes it's a weakness. But I, you know, I don't see it as that. I, once you. Think, Indulged in some, I, I love it. Yeah, talk about those early days at Hull. Then you so you get the first team coaching job. Some pressure there. Were you more nervous on your first team coaching debut, or you 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 playing? Um, yeah, I think I think when the season started, I, I was. But it was it was a funny one. I'd, I'd been there, obviously as a player, a couple of years previous, and then as an assistant coach. So I'd heard a lot of the gripes, what things that the players wanted changing, but at the same time. A part of me felt, well, you've been under three coaches now. You was under Richard Agar, Peter Sharp, and and Peter Gentle, and they've all been run out of town. And you're still doing the same thing. So I was, 
I think I said to you earlier, I was, I was pretty ruthless in some of the... When I look back at some of my, my, my half-time team talks and some of my interviews that I did, um, I, don't, I think I'd chose well, what's, the most, what's the most ruthless? Come on, Brad. Is um, I just... There was, honestly, there was... I said to Joe... I can remember saying to Joe Rundle, you can't say, there was plenty of Fs and bombs involved. And yeah, I, yeah. I can remember getting beat by Feviston and saying, your salary is worth more than their full... Back line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll shower him. <laughs> <laughs> and I think now, and I think if I if I if I went at somebody now like that, I, I don't know what the response. You know, they'd probably need counselling for a moment. So you've refined so. your style. I, I think I've had to. Yeah. Or do you yeah. break? Do you have to take I, I, a moment? You yeah, to... yeah. I think I've got better at that. But at yeah. that time, I, I just felt that was what was needed. I thought some players was taking me. Yeah. And yeah. I'd seen them do that as well. So I, yeah, there's method in it. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, right. yeah. I, I think I'd like to say it was calculated, but I don't. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't sound that calculated, does it? It didn't sound that calculated in that changing room. <laughs> At times, it's good for a player to see the emotion of the coach, I find. Sometimes yeah. you need a concise uh, appraisal of the performance, but sometimes you need to see that the emotion, that they care, and what's really going on in the mind, I reckon. I've, I've yeah. had a few few Hon sprays. Honesty. You, you're yeah. an honest coach, Rad, is I think you? so, yeah. yeah like, uh, sometimes too, too much, I think. Um, but as I said, I think I've got better. I've got better. Adding my emotions a little bit better. Yeah. Not some much, bit. but a bit. <laughs> a bit. Yeah. yeah. So some big Challenge Cup wins along the way there. And, and you know, you spoke about the ghosts of the past at Hull FC, so 2005 showing that and, and having to delve into your history to find success. How important for a club was it to actually have something to hang your hat on, you know, the 16, 17 Challenge <laughs> Cup finals? It's just something you can't, that can't be taken away. Like, yep. not... You know, no, no big headedness or it just something nobody done either. It was just doesn't matter what happens now, that, that can't be changed now. You've done that. And that was a some se a real sense of achievement for that. I think I played in the fair no, I, I was assistant coach in the thirteen final when they said it was the worst challenge cup final in history against Wigan. Um, we got big thirteen nil it, and it was, it was awful. Yeah. Um and I can remember the the night before that game, probably what a lot of teams have done pre and post. We, we had the old art to art, why are you why are you playing and what does it mean to you? And I can remember a couple of the boys, a couple of tears started and I can remember we got to Daniel Oldsworth and he came up with a statement and I'll never ever forget it. it if we don't win tomorrow, it, it's just another game <laughs> before a challenge cup final and I just that was it that had a big I, I wanted to, as an assistant I wanted to say something but I, you know it was a bite your tongue and it was um I think there were some things from that 13 Cup final that I learned and took notes would have done better if I ever get there. And I think, um, thankfully, we got you know, a fair few of them right. Just uh, one thing I wanted to pick up on was we spoke about characters before and players who come and have a big influence on others. How important was Gareth Ellis to those, you know, those years of success in the Challenge Cup? Really big, really big. And, and big as well because I, I felt like he was coming out of his shell. Um, his character was coming out. His presence was always there. When he was in a room, you, knew, you only have to look at the size of him. You know he's in a room, but, it, but I handed him the captaincy gas and he, didn't, he, he isn't a natural speaker amongst, amongst people. He's got so much better at it now, obviously, but at that time, it was, a, it was all learning in progress, I suppose. But what he did on the field, um, there's not many you've played with that like you stand next to and you're a little bit in awe of he. He was he was one of them, and you talk about challenges. He he used to thrive on being an underdog and having some, you know, his leg hanging off and getting through that and still getting over his opposite number. He, he you know, you'd, you'd watch him do team running. And you'd think, God, he looks busted to bits here. I'm not going to get 40 minutes out of this bloke tomorrow. And 80 minutes in, he's still whacking blokes and that. That's a. Uh, I've spot with guys about this. That's just, he, he had a similar. He had a stats very similar to Martin. I think. So, no matter what guys did, it was it was not quite good enough. But it did all right. <laughs> it did all right. It did all right. So there's like great memories there, at Hull, and, and you're learning all the time. But the, there's there's a harsh reality to the, the job that you do, isn't there? That you know, is there an inevitability that at some stage you're going to get flicked? Nailed on, yeah. yeah. And, and not many, not many go out on their terms. And, and even when they do go out on their terms, like for example, Daryl last year, that you'd say that was his terms. He was going up to a. Even that ended a little bit sour. Even when you say, you know, it's, it's an amicable. I'm going to a, a perceived bigger club at the end of the year. I think even that ended. You know, whether that was with the spectators or the environment, that, 
it's, I don't think there's ever a, unless you walk with the grand final ring on you, I don't think there's too many um, fairy tale endings. And how does that sit with you? You know this, because your job has immediate consequences, whereas lots of people exist in life and there's no feedback or no consequences, isn't there? Do you, does that sit heavy on you? Is I, I it... No, I think I've, Hull, you have to be uh, become immune to that, I think, because it is it's mm. it's claustrophobic. It's you know you go to you, you'd lose a game on a weekend and then you'd be in Asda the following Friday, getting ready for the next buying game. A, buying buy, a suit, buy, yeah, 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 <laughs> buying a George <laughs> suit, medium, medium. Um, and I, I find a, what happened last week, and I'm th you've just got over that. Do you know mm. what I mean? You tried putting that to bed, and you're having to die, you know, and, and you have to you, you have to give them. The time, you know, because otherwise you get called an arrogant. So it's, it's. Uh, I, th I think your whole hull is is it's unique. It's a unique um, city regarding rugby league. And it was a weird situation when you lost your job there. That was a. It was, <laughs> it was bizarre, wasn't it? Watching yeah. it, because if you give us a bit more detail, because you were there, you know, I'm. Yeah, I'd be yeah, guessing. no, it was. Um, it was. It, I think bizarre is probably the probably surreal is. Probably another way of describing it, and it, it was funny. It was my missus never comes to watch the games, and she came to that one for some. And I, I'll never know why. It was I don't know. I genuinely don't know. But it was obviously I'd come down after the game, sat in the changing rooms waiting. For, there's two sets of changing rooms at, at the KC: one where the staff sit and one where the players sit. And I was waiting for the players to come in off the field. And the CEO James Clark said, "Oh, Adam, you know, give it the old one of them." And that had never happened before. So that was a then I got ushered off into a small bar and, and obviously Adam said, look, I'm going to have to make a change. And it was one of them, not a problem. I, I understand, you know, it was a horrendous performance. Um, the couple of years before, we'd had a couple of collapsing performances where they'd yeah. give in, give in. Um, and I think, you know, look, looking back, it was the right time and it was a, yeah, it was the right time for me. Though my pride, I wouldn't have quit. But it was, you know, it generally was the right time. Was it the right way of doing it? Definitely not. Um, so having been told that, um, I then go into the change rooms to tell tell the boys. Then I go into the other um, change rooms again with the staff, thanked all the staff. And then I'm thinking, my missus is here. So uh, I goes out with, with uh, Capali Asina and she found out obviously on, she was in the clubhouse, in the, in the bar and she found out on the TV. So that was, she was, I was more worried about her than I was yeah. Myself, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I, it was just one of the, you know, it was one of them things for me. But for her, it was when she don't go, she, she never come to another game, <laughs> name a game again. I think so. Um, yeah, it was a, it was surreal. And then the day, you know, the day after, there's a bit of numbness there. But it was, it, there was relief. I slept that night. Really. Whereas normally, after that performance, I wouldn't. I'd have been up all night and I'd, uh, you know, probably watched it back three or four times because it was a televised game. Um, but I slept. I slept that night. That's a you know. sign then, isn't it? You think? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And what did you... Do, do you forgive? Are you a forgiving person? Yeah, look, he's... A, he, Adam is, is very... He's, he's in, you know, he, he's emotional. He's an emo you only have to look at him when the sky camera... You know, when they score a try or the concede a try. Um, because I, I'd had that relationship with him, I, I was very... I knew what Adam was like. And... Um, a bit like my interviews after a game when I said I'd gone to town on players straight when you get a camera put in your mouth, uh, in your face, sorry. I, um, well, that's probably one of the moments for him. So yeah, do I forgive you? Yeah, look, we've all done things, we've all done things that we um, wish you'd turn back time. You do it the day after and you do it probably um, in a different manner. Yeah, it's a strange place to be, a rugby club, when your coach is gone. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah. Those days after the head coach is gone, well, I think it automatic. It's a quick win for a chairman or a chief exec because you get always get a response off players, don't you? I think you do anyway because they're all, everyone's on edge. They're like, "Oh, does this new coach like me? I need to impress." And there's, I think you get a little rise out of players, but it's only short term. Then you get short term rise, but then it's it's whether the new person is better long term for the club than the previous guy. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a weird place, you're right. Yeah. What's the biggest mistake, Radders? Do you think if you made any mistakes then in that first stint as a head coach, what what do you think? Was the biggest thing now, if you if you had to take forward into your future sort of coaching career, what was the one thing that you? Um. Prob probably my abruptness and 
I, I, I had to tone it down. I couldn't, I wouldn't have lasted, I wouldn't have got seven years there being how I was them first two years. I had to, I had to um, pull back from the media, what I was saying in the media and probably what I was saying in front of the group as well. Um, I was, I was too, um, too direct and too to the point, I think. So what, obviously you, you, you're out of work at this point and then what, when do you start thinking about, did um, you need to get back into work or did you have a period where you no, think, no, right, COVID, I'm sweet. COVID happened yeah. the, the Wednesday. Yeah. So we all, the, the country went into lockdown. So you started playing golf three I times. Playing golf, yeah. <laughs> so literally it was... Handicap came down. Yeah, oh, an alcoholic and, and an unbelievable golfer at that point. <laughs> Sounds like John, John Daly. Daly. John it was, Daly. But it was, it was so, that, so that happened and then... Where where we are, it was a it was a niche, so you could sell take you know, sell take away alcohol. Yeah. So we the the lodge where where, where I was, we started to it, the, on Sutton. There's a public footpath there, so we could sell alcohol for people to go on the golf course. Well, it ended up coming to be a festival. <laughs> so I ended up getting doorman to to I ended up getting like eight eight doorman to to manage people well, on this the golf, golf course. course. It, it was the best year, honestly. It was yeah. a, I had a during that time, I had agreed to go to Dallas, um, rugby union, obviously. Yeah. And but at the time, I'm thinking, well, this is this is. I don't want this to end. This COVID's <laughs> the best thing that I shouldn't say that. This, you know, this situation is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I, I'm stress free. The golf game's going through the roof, and I can actually drink six pints without needing a taxi home now. So it was, things was on the up. So and then, that, what was yeah. the attraction to America and rugby union? And um, yeah, just a, a, a chap called Alan Clark, who was the Ospreys coach a couple of years ago, he, he came to Hull and watched us for, for a week. And um, obviously when I, when I got, the, got the flick, he, he got in touch a couple of months later and just there's a new franchise starting up in, in, in the States. I would not even didn't even know it was going on out there. So obviously started to have a little look at that and could see that it, what's happening now, it's starting to get big. Mm. Um, and it was just something, you know, I'd actually played rugby union when I finished playing league and I'd coached rugby union, whole rugby union as well for 12 months. So um, it was something I was, you know, intrigued by. Um, and it was a, you know, it was, it was a way, which was, which was a difficult one, but it was only half, half of the year. So I'd be home for, for the back half of the year through summer. Um, so it was something I was, you know, it was, it was hopefully going to be a, a start of a path obviously to get involved in in rugby union this this side of the world how does your personality translate into american you, i don't know i don't did uh, you yeah, do all right yeah, yeah i reckon i'd have gone all right <laughs> they're, they're all, they're all they're very I, enthusiastic yeah, though, aren't they? yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, really really positive when when you see the facilities they're training in as well you know dallas they're at the they're training at the dallas cowboys oh, training facilities. And obviously, I, when I rock up to Cass every day, I'm thinking to myself, "This, this can't be right." This. <laughs> what, so what have I done? What have you done? <laughs> so Castleford, then let's get onto the this year. Now you, you know what you've done with Castleford so far. So from the outside, flash tough job mm. taking over from, mm. you know, Sir Daryl Powell, who's you know had a, a long period with the club. That brings some challenges, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think um, Rad has alluded to it before. Like for a long time, he was. He was the man there. All the fans loved him, and whoever followed him was always going to be a tough job. And uh, I think there's been a, a good, there's been a decent turnover of players as well. Which at first I thought was a negative, but in hindsight, I think you know with a new coach having new players and a new start, it's, it's good, pretty good really. Uh, and we've seen these last couple of months how well Castle been playing. So they like good rugby. It's a great place to play, and it's it's a real part of the community, the rugby club, isn't it? It's massive, yeah. And I, you probably I think you alluded to it when when you pull into the town. You know, you, you you can't drive past ten people without one of them having a bit of cask gear. Love a singlet. I'm representing it's not, it's today. Not a t-shirt. They love no, the singlet. It. Yeah. There, it's the yeah, best. Yeah. They like pair it with the NRL shorts. I find. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah it's um, it's rugby, it's rugby mad. Um, and when you know, when I always remember 17 when there was when there was flying, and I can remember, you know, we'd go to Brid or Scarborough for a day in the summer, and just the amount of people in cask gear in and I think that was obviously their holiday venue at that point, but it was. You know when when they're doing well and the 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 club's doing well, the, the town's buzzing. I think. Mm. Yeah. And how do you rate the starts of the year for you, for you guys? Like, what, how it's yeah. Um, the start was horrendous. Yeah. Start for, horrendous through injuries. Um, <laughs> the suspensions at that point was just something we've never you know never been involved with. It was, again, you know the the the, the 
petrified of the old concussion, which I understand. Um, but at that time, it was it was so frustrating. Um, it just won't, you know. It's thankfully it's it's, it's gone in the other direction again. Um, but at that point, I I just couldn't understand where people agreeing with it. You know, I think I said a couple of times um, there was a, a suspension. And I think round three of Beretta for Emo literally brushed somebody's fringe and that, again that wasn't the game that I'd grown up playing and wasn't the game that I admired and loved to watch and when I could hear the commentary and people saying well this is the players are going to have to adapt and I'm thinking well what what are we actually going to have to adapt to here because mm -hmm. if that's the game then um, but it has gone back hasn't it just um, quietly you know, yeah subtly <laughs> subtly and, and it's funny you know you, you, the coaches meeting it's you coaches done a great job of you know getting your players to <laughs> learn the new rules uh, yeah, 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 we have. <laughs> yeah. We have. Well, fantastic, fantastic job, coach. It's yeah. um, it had to. It happened in rugby union twelve yeah, yeah, months yeah, prior. Yeah. Um, and he had contact. Boom, you're off. You're gone. And it was ten minutes for everybody. And I, and I think the same thing happened. What's disappointing is we we didn't learn from that when we when I think we could have. Um, but I understand it. I understand we've only got one insurance company, and you know that insurance company is very very fragile in terms of where the concussion yeah. is going. So we have to. We have to do right by the players. Um, and I think the protocols that are in place are a significant improvement of what's gone before us. Um, but that, that six round period was was crazy. Crazy and could have cost somebody a job, you know, genuinely. Yeah, we, yeah, I think yeah, we yeah. was top of the league for sending offs, top of the league um, for yellow cards, but bottom of the league. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a bad and you know what? No, you get a twitchy, you get a twitchy yeah. chairman that, yeah. that that can lose somebody a job. And mm. thankfully, it's like I said, the the dust seems to have settled and the, the yeah. waves have calmed a bit. Well, um, let's talk about the last the last six weeks, let's say. You, yeah. You've got to be de delighted, really, with, with the effort from your team, the output that your team, you know, the, 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 the rugby that you're playing has, has, has been great. Yeah, please, re really please. And, you know, we, we, it's taken a while to convince, you know, some, some, some blokes... I'm really focused on the on the, the your, your intent and your attitude and and not so much the detail of what's going on in the game and getting to this point for that play and it's it's the intent that you apply that with and if you make a mistake doing that well you've got some intent in your d you can you can mask that and get away with and cover that and still win a game of football and i think that's there's there's been some real buying from that over the last sort of month and a half in the effort areas you know whether that be kick chase or whether that be getting off the ground when you when you're under fatigue that they've they've really bought into that these last four or five weeks six weeks i don't think it's a coincidence we've picked up results during that period as well and you, you always find that the attitude and intent is going well for a team when you've got injury suspensions lads playing out of position it was greg eager in the half even yeah, in the half yeah the yeah it was like wally lewis out there yeah. you still it's find a way to win yeah. if if things are going against you and you kind of find a why to win that's that's a real good test, I think. Rugby league can be you can be as technical as you like with rugby league, but actually you can be as simple as you like as well. And, and there's a balance to be had, isn't there? It's being deeply technical, but also having the simple things right. And and the effort areas in the game, the 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 physicality of the game, for me, never really changes. You know, we we change the techniques and we change certain things. The rules. The rules. Yeah. yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah, but we're yeah. tinkering with all these bits. But underpinning the best teams in the competition, you know, Wigan and St Helens. Is effort, yeah. It, it is intent as well, and, and I think that's in any sport, in, a, so in any walk of life. You know, the the people that you had or have admiration for, teams you have admiration for, have got that in abundance. And I think um, I don't think that will change. And trying to get that every week is is a difficult, you know, difficult thing. And the teams that do now on win the competition most yeah. seasons, the team that's done it the best over the last four years have won the competition over the last four years in St. Helens. The the you know, you looked at some of their efforts early on in the season, particularly on sort of the kick chase and things like that, and blokes that had just made three tackles previous and still, t you know, tear assing down there. It's it, it's admirable, and when you when you shift in mentality a little bit in a group of players from the technical and the detail and the um, the, the focus being on that to the to the core of what we do as a game, that's 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 been. Um, it, I didn't think it'd be that a challenge, and it has trying to ingrain that. 
Yeah, well, it's funny, we were having a chat. We were with uh, Johnny Burstow, the, the England cricketer today, and we said about intent. And he's been playing really well uh, for England. And, and one thing he said, and it just sort of stuck with me when you were saying about just having intent about what you do, is, uh, you know, he'd go into bat and he'd just be, you know, just trying to get in, play it safe, or, you know, just, just try and get his bat on the ball. And then he had a change in mindset and he went, I'm just going to fucking twat this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and sometimes in rugby, mm -hmm. you know, like Gaz Ellis just thinks I'm going to whack you, doesn't he? He doesn't mm -hmm. think I'm going to get my right foot in yeah, this position. Yeah, yeah. So intent mm -hmm. is infectious. Yeah. And intent sometimes just is, is the only way, isn't it? Because yeah. you played with intent. You played your whole career with intent, Radders. Mm -hmm. That's because I weren't very good technically. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it was? <laughs> but do you know what? There's been, there's been um, you know, you can name so many players that have, that have had that, and you've got so much admiration for them and their effort areas. Um, yeah, it's a competitiveness again. You know, trying to ingrain that in in the team, the club, the youth, whatever, whatever that is. That's you know one of the most difficult challenges as a coach, I think. Yeah, and Flash Cast this year. Where, where can you see him? getting to the, the, the there's a big chunk in the mix for the playoffs isn't there yeah yeah I think start of the season you probably didn't think they'd make the playoffs but the way they're going now and on the day they're, they're a match for anyone I think the top two are going to be hard to beat I think Wigan and Saints are, have I think Wigan have been really impressive how they've kicked on this year they've been so much better than the previous years and Saints are Saints but I think Huddersfield have been good Cass obviously uh, Catalan I think they're they're all kind of battling just for, to, to compete with the top two for me. And the aim, Radders, is to just get your timing right this year, isn't it? You know, get yeah, players back. Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen where you just sneak in and, and the all five season, we, we crept into the we kept, crept into the top six and went on, a, I think it was an 11 game winning streak and, and won the grand final that year. It's, you know, that can happen, but it's I'm a realist that there's only four clubs ever won the grand final. And, yeah. you know, that, that tells you how difficult it is to break that. Um, we'd need an, an awful lot of things to go right for us to, to get that. But um, if we can hand on out, say it's not for a lack of effort. Um, you know, I'll be really proud and really proud. Like you said, it's it's a really tardy trait to have when there's a couple of obstacles thrown in your way to carry on scrapping and, and keep swimming against the tide, which I think we have been. You know, and I, I don't want to get too carried away because we've got a big one on Friday. Um, it's a it's an impressive trait to have as a team. I think. Yeah, well, it's been fascinating yeah, really good. Uh, yeah, having you on, mate. Good to hear about. Thank you. I think we hear a lot about, you know, what you do now, but it's more interesting how you got to where you got to and your obsessive, like, personality, how much you love <laughs> the game. And then I think applying all of that robustness, the toughness, the old school, but then having to refine it into, like, a modern workplace, you know. <laughs> it's like a challenge, isn't it? And and we wish you, like, all, all the best, so... Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, our pleasure. Well, that was uh, out of your league. That was Lee Radford. Really interesting stuff there from Lee. Uh, download this podcast and all the other podcasts from wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, good evening.